Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's in-depth ag forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. My first map today is going to be looking at the weekend's total rainfall. So we've got here 72 hours of total accumulated precipitation. And what's important to kind of point out here is just a few things. This southwest monsoon is still cranking, had a lot of daily convective events across parts of the southeast, dropping some locally heavy rainfall. But then we've seen moving through parts of the northern plains and then into this section of the Corn Belt, some locally very heavy rains but it is just as important to see those locations that were missed as to see the locations that did receive a lot of rainfall. We're going to take a more in-depth look at that in just a few seconds. The place that's really seen the largest deficits in rainfall now almost 50 days stretch is going to be parts of Texas and Oklahoma, pockets of Kansas, Missouri, Arkansas, and then the western side here of Tennessee and Kentucky. There are also places through southern Iowa, central Illinois that have missed out on this as well including parts of uh, Missouri. And that's not to be all-inclusive. There's been a lot of locations that desperately needed rainfall uh, during the extremely high temperatures that this section uh, of the country has kind of endured. Now, just thinking about this, I was watching some of the storms this past weekend that were rolling through parts of North Dakota. Those uh, absolutely monstrous storms up there. And I'm going to show you, they were putting down some hail. Over the last three days, you can see some of the hail streaks in the, uh, in the mesh data here from the MRMS, looking at uh, where some of those larger storms were producing hail. Uh, by the way, if any of you ever need a hail report, um, I, I can provide that for you. Uh, any location, got a nice database of it. But you can see throughout the Midwest, several of these storms just here over the weekend producing some large hail. But I got to take you to these storms in North Dakota. On Twitter, uh, this was put up by Josh Fry. Okay, um, this is his work. I just got to show you his picture. He sent this to the National Weather Service. That, man, Josh, that is an, an absolutely incredible uh, view of a supercell in North Dakota. We, we often call these uh, in, in, in our field the mothership. Uh, you can see the striations here on the outside of this. This uh, very, very um, impressive supercell. So well done capturing that photo, but I just wanted to make sure and get you all the credit for that one. But where we have to go with this, okay, now that we've taken that very quick look at the weekend, is we got to talk about where the pattern has gone since then. And I got to compare it to what we've seen uh, so far for honestly the last, you know, 50 plus days. So June uh, 1st, all the way through July 22nd. Now, what you're looking at here is um, the wind at the jet stream level compared to normal. So you're seeing anomalous wind. And throughout basically that whole time period, there was just persistent troughs of low pressure here that ran up into ridges that came in through this area, right? That was what we saw so much of. And I'd made such a case last week that it was very, very limited short time periods so far this spring and now into summer that we've eliminated the presence of this trough off the West Coast. But we saw the forecast models suggesting that that was going to go away. And we need to talk about how long it's going to be away and when it's coming back because that's going to be critical to the change in the forecast we've seen. Now today on satellite, just some absolutely incredible imagery here. Take a look at this. If we just kind of rock back and forth over this afternoon. A couple things to take note of. We still have, let's start in the west, a lot of wildfire smoke from the Oak Fire, which is right here. You can even see some of the wildfire smoke from that fire right there in this part of Idaho as well. But as I look here across the rest of the country, I was just kind of mesmerized by this today because you can see the influence of, of the main systems. There's a low here around the Hudson Bay. There's one coming through the northern Canadian prairie just off the top here that's going to drag a front through but take a look at what the wind shear is doing to the tops of these storms can you watch right here with me for just a second as i play this do you see how the tops are getting blown off of these storms curling around like that that's really the influence of this upcoming pattern we're going to spend some time here discussing in just a few moments before I get there, though, I would like to just mention something going on in the tropics. See at the very end of the animation, the kind of the discoloring that you see here, all in this area? That's all Saharan dust, and that turns out to be a pretty important factor right now that's controlling what's going on in the tropics. Now, the National Hurricane Center, not looking at much uh, over the next five days, as you can see. A big reason for that, take a look at this, here comes sunset today. You can see all of this dust spread through here. Some of the active tropical convection down here is not really getting organized, nor is it along the Lesser Antilles or in the Caribbean or even anywhere in the Gulf. Do you notice we just don't see any large areas uh, of convective activity that could be spawned into a hurricane? And when I looking at this dust, I just want to show you something. The the forecast of it is just it's just impressive. This is a lot of Saharan dust. 
Now it's an indicator of the activity going on across the Sahel, which means we're producing these tropical waves. I mean, you can see them crashing over like this, but the air is too dry and too dusty, I think, to really result in the building of any significant tropical systems. And that's why, again, over the next five to 10 days, we're just not seeing much in the way of tropical development, but we know it's, we're going into August, a very active month overall. Now we still have warm water there. So there is the, the energy, the fuel that could be used to produce a large tropical system. We also still have, take a look, there's our La Nina. It's still very strong trade winds in this area. But as we discussed so much last week, the more dominant factor, I think, in the Pacific is the warmer water that's here and the warmer water you see in the Bering Sea over toward north of Japan. Now, I'd like to continue the discussion about this from last week because I think the position of this warm water is critical to this pattern. What it did not do was migrate toward the west coast. If it had migrated toward the west coast, then the permanence of any ridge that forms here uh, would have been much longer in the fork. In other words, we would have built a ridge around that heat that then would allow troughing in the Midwest and change the whole pattern for the rest of summer. But it stayed west. I mean, you can see where it is currently located between Hawaii and the Aleutian Islands. And I think that's going to allow, that's going to be part of the reason why we're going to be able to see troughs of low pressure reforming in this area where they've been for so long. Now, when I tell you this La Nina is still kicking and, and, and strong, it's mostly being reflected in the, the trade wind behavior here. I mean, we can see that those trade winds are still smoking in this area. I've said that word a bunch, but I'm, I'll be honest with you. I don't remember recently a summer that has just had such persistently strong trade winds in this region. It's outdoing right now what the MJO is capable of doing because the westerly wind bursts are just keeping the, you know, the position of the MJO either here or just off of the coast of Africa. And it seems to be the most dominant teleconnection coming out of the tropics right now. But it is midsummer, which means teleconnections are weak just by the fact that it's summertime. In winter, they're so much stronger simply because of the greater temperature gradient that happens between the equator and the pole during winter, and therefore the more uh, energetic the jet stream can be. So I look at all of that and I say, well, going forward, what does this mean? So I looked for August and September from uh, 1980 to 2016, and we started to ask ourselves if we're going to see an active hurricane season, since we're kind of talking about that right now, what do we need to see in terms of the winds? And keeping those strong trade winds going like this here is critical to this. Keeping those strong trade winds is highly correlated, about negative 0.5, and in some places even a little higher than that, which means when we see this continuing into the near future, once some of that dust is eliminated, we're going to start to see a lot of activity coming off of Africa. And I think that's going to be very important. Also, westerly wind bursts here and here are important as well. That actually reduces wind shear whenever you see these westerly wind bursts in the Caribbean and the open Atlantic. Okay, Because the trade winds are normally this way. So that slows them down. So even though we're kind of out of the woods in the near term for any tropical development, I, I still don't feel as though the main story has been taken off the page that we could see of an active season this year. So that's a quick update on the tropics. But remember, what I was really seeing that was fascinating was... Watch the cloud tops just get blown off and curl around this, uh, this high pressure cell right here. There's actually mid-level high pressure in this area. And what's so fascinating about it is you can see it in the flow. See it right here? Now, we have one low here and another low there, and they're just going to work their way curling around this broader trough that's sitting around the Hudson Bay. But here's the ridge we'd not seen all spring and summer really have any sort of staying power. So in the near term, in other words, this next week, the ridge dominates, the heat builds up the west, where the faster winds sweep through here, that's where our kind of slow moving fronts are going to be, which is going to deliver a lot of very heavy rainfall uh, really south of that. I should have drawn that a little bit farther to the south here, getting into the Appalachian Mountains to the Ohio Valley. And that's going to be the, the critical piece. But I don't think this ridge is going to last for very long. And we've seen some evidence build over the weekend. And as we talked about last week, there was a lot of spread in the models last week. They've come together now with a bit of a new solution. We need to talk about that. Because today, look, south of that flow, triple digit heat. Running up the west coast, they're still yet to see their high temperatures here. Even though it's 5 o'clock central time, we'll reach those peak temperatures very soon here in the west. And this is the way the temperatures are going to be for the next several days. 
but we, we're starting to see better model agreement of this breaking down. And we started it, seeing it over the weekend. Are you ready? So here we go. This is what you just saw me draw. Now, as we go forward through Monday into Tuesday and Wednesday, look, it's still there. Broader trough hugging between uh, you know parts of the Great Lakes and the Hudson Bay. And that's going to leave a front here. It's fed around this high. I mean, we're just pumping moisture into this. And there's going to be some very heavy rainfall kind of right in through here. But watch as we go out past Thursday into Friday into next weekend. As we play into early next week, do you see the kind of how this particular region is kind of regaining its position in the ridge? And look what showed up. There's a trough here and a trough there. So the flow is coming around, bumping up the Canadian Prairie, and then diving around this next one. And this is only out there to August 2nd. You keep playing through that, and the models have gone right back by day 10 to that feature having a trough just off the west coast. So the ridge that's here now is already gone by the time we get eight, nine, 10 days out. And now the ridge kind of regains its foothold right here in the Southern Plains. Uh, and, and that takes us back to what we anticipated all summer. See it? One, two, three. Remember we talked about the triple ridge setup? This is a typical midsummer setup when there's a La Nina and we're going right back over to it. So this is what the forecast models are doing. Over the next five days, the frontal boundary stalled here. It connects up with the southwest monsoon. And through the Ohio River Valley, I'll show you in a few moments, really a high chance of heavy rainfall. Notice to the north of that, a very sharp gradient where if you're north of this, if you didn't get the weekend rains, we're drier in Iowa, Minnesota, Wisconsin, northern Illinois, Michigan. See this area? This area right in through here, drier. But right in through this pocket, could see some pretty heavy rains. Drier in Texas, drier in the southeast. Subtropical ridges keeping uh, that area protected. Now, let this five-day window slide forward. This is now out there to August 2nd. This is the first five days of August right here. And you notice that going into that second week, what happened again? Southwest monsoon came back on. We see the drier conditions in the midsection of the country. We're back to a more active Canadian storm track. And if you're kind of feeling like you've heard me say that before, I've been saying that all of June and most of July until this last week. The models are taking things back to where they were. Now, the rains over the next week are absolutely critical because of this. When you see right now where our soil moisture deficits and surpluses sit, like here in parts of New England in the Mid-Atlantic, deficits, Look right here along the Ohio River Valley, down to the lower Mississippi River Valley, and then a large section of the mid part of the United States. The forecast I'm about to share with you here, these are the areas that must get precipitation before that large ridge comes and sets back up again. Because if they don't, all we're going to get out of this are ridge riders. And just as we saw in June and July, it's hit or miss. Some people keep getting the good rains and others miss out on it. So, those areas that have missed out as of late are shown here. This is our last two weeks looking at precipitation as a percent of normal. And what you can see here is that big sections of central Illinois, look at this part of southern Iowa, look right in here in western Iowa, getting into this part of southwestern Minnesota, throughout South Dakota, then big area in parts of Kansas. Yeah, we had some good rains right in through here lately, but leading from Kansas into Missouri. And then, of course, we've been talking about the historic drought in parts of Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Texas. You see, there's a lot of pockets in the midsection of the country that have been very, very dry. Same thing through parts of the Mid-Atlantic into New England. And the West Coast, which is normally dry this year, with all the heat that's coming in, this is really going to increase the wildfire threat in the West. Because by the time, again, we set this ridge back up, take a look at what they're worried about here in terms of excessive heat. This was just released today by the Climate Prediction Center. Looking out there from August 2nd through August 4th, this is the region where we're concerned about a high risk of excessive heat. So we're talking triple digit temperatures here, right here at the beginning of the month of August. Now, I gave you all that as a setup because all of the long range models were just initialized with that progression. So it is no surprise that the new European model forecast took this back over dry again. Why is it wetter here? Well, part of that's going on right now. But when you have a ridge of high pressure that flows over like this, that northwest flow delivers more storms in this area. They kind of cascade through parts of the Mid-South, the Tennessee Valley, the Ohio River Valley. And with a subtropical high here, a, a high here, and another one way over here, you end up getting around all of them, 
flow that's doing this. Okay, and on the bottom sides of it, it's doing that. See it? So we're bringing moisture into the southwest monsoon. We're bringing moisture in to that, those fronts that stall in this area. And over the top, there'll be an active Canadian storm track once again. So this is the new August outlook from the European model. And compared to the previous run, this was the previous run, the new model initialization was drier, and that's why we see the drier conditions here. On the temperature side of it, it is also warmer than the previous run. And again, this is very typical La Nina behavior, and it seems as though the La Nina is winning out, allowing for the trough redevelopment off of the Pacific Northwest Coast. So all the heat we're about to endure along the West Coast, especially the Pacific Northwest, lasts about eight days. And then we go back over to a pattern that's uh, basically going to be more reflective of what we call average summer temperatures. Unfortunately, this means that the new outlook released by the Climate Prediction Center for July through uh, sep uh, August, September, and October now begins to reflect that late season drought redevelopment in the western Corn Belt. Sees it down here redeveloping in the lower Mississippi River Valley. And where we've had those recent wildfires coming out of parts of Idaho into this part of Montana, drought developing as well. So this, um, again, was kind of the fear that we had with the pattern reverting back to what it was. Now, let's talk a little bit about what to expect in the near term, because there's been a lot of shifts in the near term forecast. We begin with an all hazards weather map. Along the east coast right now, this is all severe thunderstorm watch. You come right in here into this part of Missouri and Illinois and Indiana, this is all flood watch. And this, I'll put a big question mark over that. We've been struggling all day with this. We still have heat advisories and excessive heat warnings out for parts of Oklahoma. You saw the high temperatures at the beginning, but the southwest monsoon is on, so this is all flood watch here. In the Pacific Northwest, excessive heat warning surrounded by heat advisories, and that's all due to the position of that ridge. Let's take a look at where there are storms right now. This is this evening here on, on, on Monday evening. And again, look at all the active storms down in the southwest monsoon and also down here in the southeast and running right up the east coast where those storms are going. Again, one of my favorite sites, blitzertongue.org. Go look it up. It's a great one. I also link it in my morning reports. But where this is all going, I think, is best seen in this animation. This is tomorrow morning on Tuesday. There's a low here and a low here. And they're leaving fronts. There's the first one. There's the second one. But around, the, see the large subtropical ridge that's kind of centered all in through here? The flow is coming around, meeting it like this. So what you end up getting is drier conditions to the south. Outside of some isolated daily convective events, just diurnal storms, drier. But everything kind of meets where these weak fronts swipe through, tapping into that moisture, keeping things quite wet in here. But it has been maddening to see the model shift around the northern edge of this rain. And I say it's maddening because I live in Champaign County, and I'm one of the driest counties in the state of Illinois right now. And the storms which were forecast for us this morning shifted south, and I'm going to show you what I'm talking about. This is the probability over the next 48 hours of getting an inch of rain. Now look at how fine that line is through northern Missouri, central Illinois, down right here along the Ohio River Valley. As I expand this through the end of this week, let's just stop it here Saturday night. This is the probability of getting one inch of rain. The northern extent of this has shifted south all day long, right through there. Okay, So if you're watching this and you're in this area, it's shifted south. If we just take this out, let's go all the way out 10 days. Why not? And stop it right here. That's the probability of getting an inch. This is the probability of getting two inches, excuse me, and this is the probability of getting four. So parts of Kentucky, Tennessee, the Ohio River Valley, right over to West Virginia, pushing up against the Appalachian Mountains, very high chance of flooding rains. And uh, parts of Tennessee and Kentucky, right, right in the area, have been very dry. So to see all this rain come through is, it's big time, and it's, it's happening uh, all at once. Now, high-res models, again, this has just been maddening. As we play through tonight, getting into tomorrow morning on Tuesday, there's our next system. See the front it's bringing through up here? Here's the stalled out front connected to that system that's over here in parts of Quebec. And this morning, this band of heavy rain was forecast to be here. And it's just shifted south with each new model run. So that front brings in the heavy rain right through the I-70 corridor, south of Indianapolis as well and takes it right over Louisville and eventually toward the Ohio River Valley, which of course Louisville's in, but then moves it toward uh, 
you know, the mountains. There'll be scattered convection in the Carolinas and Virginia, scattered storms that are wrapping up here, pulling into parts of Kansas. And of course, that frontal boundary sits right here by Tuesday evening. We then keep playing this forward to see the front swiping through parts of Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa. This is all going to be a story of watching the radar to see who gets the rain and who doesn't. Because I'll tell you, the models have done a terrible job pinpointing the rain. They give us the idea, but they don't, of course, get it right exactly where it's going to be. Storms then blow up again, whoops, right on that same area in the overnight hours on Tuesday into Wednesday. And again, I, if I could change this, I'd say just broaden it. Give them rain, but give it some to us as well. Because there's some pockets up there that have been drier. you know, And that's why I showed you, look, this is an area that needs it. And the heaviest rain is just south of it. That's, that's the main story if you're right there in that part of the Midwest. Sorry. Uh, whoops, one too many clicks. We keep going forward with this out to Wednesday, and you see how the pattern is dominated by those lows, dragging the fronts through, connecting them up with the southwest monsoon. That's the name of the game. How far to the south do they make it is all determined by the flow around the subtropical ridge. So right now, as I go to show you the European versus the GFS, just to take note again, uh, the European has once again climbed on top as having the best pattern match compared to the GFS in red. Uh, so when we look at both models, just understand that right now, the one on the right, the European is performing better than GFS, but they both have the same thing. You'll see one low here, another low there. See them? One, two. And as they come through Monday into Tuesday, into Wednesday, let's stop this Wednesday evening. They both have the same features. See, they're leaving these fronts here. And the first front is right out there. That's the benefit of the deeper trough over the Hudson Bay while the ridge builds in the Gulf of Alaska. But as you saw, that doesn't last very long. So going from Wednesday into Thursday, look at this curl up and leaving its front right in through here. That's Thursday night where we're expecting the rain. Going forward into Friday, see where the front still remains? High pressure's building in behind it, and yes, it's a little cooler, thank goodness, but that front, how far south does it sag? That's what we see here on Saturday afternoon, getting towards Saturday evening. Let's play this on into Sunday and go on out there toward Monday. You see the models are just leaving that frontal boundary, lingering right in this area. So I played you out a week. If I show you the individual model runs, let's put them together. Here we are playing through Tuesday and Wednesday. So that's the quarter of heaviest rain. Seems to be right here on I-70 uh, initially. And then we go into Thursday and Friday. So that's your next, you know, basically five days worth of rainfall. And then as we add in the weekend and take it all the way out there to, there you go, that's a seven-day forecast. You can compare that to the GFS. So watch, European GFS. The differences are seen here. Remember, when you look at these maps, European is wetter with these colors. The GFS is wetter with those. Once again, the European is the wetter model with that stalled out boundary right in through here. And you can just kind of take a good look at where, especially if in your region, which models are going to be doing, uh, performing, not performing better, but producing more precipitation or less. Now, from here, I got to show you with all that heat still staying in Texas, because it's south of that front, remember? And then the ridge going up the west. Over the next seven days, we'll see evaporation rates in Texas go over two and a half inches a week. Same thing for the southwest, getting up to the Columbia Basin and parts of the Snake River Valley. Evaporation rates between two to three plus inches a week. So that's what that heat's really doing here. But it does not matter which model I show you. Here's the 12Z uh, GFS ensemble. See the ridge? See the trough? That's the forecast for August 4th. This would be the European, almost identical overall with the pattern. And that's why when we get out there fully into week two, we go right back to what we talked about in June and early July. Active southwest monsoon, ridge of higher pressure coming around just like this, giving us dry risks in here just with isolated storms. The storms then run over the top. These ridge riders just like this, they build down in this direction, and there's an active Canadian storm track. It's just the same pattern we talked about, the La Nina dominating, taking us back there. So the big question is, what do the temperatures do to follow this? And that's where we'll wrap this video up today. Here is today's highs. We've already experienced these. Let's go on into tomorrow on Tuesday. Absolute scorcher in the Northwest. That's why the excessive heat warnings are out. Same thing from Texas to Oklahoma, Arkansas, and parts of Southern Missouri and Southern Kansas. But you go north of there, and we're in the cooler air in the rain air, uh, uh, air that's cooled by the rain. 
So this is Wednesday's highs compared to normal. Again, 106. Look at this, Yakima, 106 degrees Fahrenheit. Getting into Thursday, 108 in Yakima. I'm sorry, I just keep poking on, you know, make looking at Yakima here just because it's such impressive uh, temperatures here in this part uh, of the Columbia Basin. By the time we get to the weekend, though, there's Friday, getting into Saturday and Sunday. Did you see the heat spread? That's the ridge reopening back in the midsection of the country. And we can really see it well by looking at this five-day sliding window. So here we are, sliding forward one day at a time, a five-day sliding window, and I'll park it right here on day five through 10, which gets us out to the 4th of August. So that's the 31st through the 4th. Now from there, watch the heat go right back to the midsection of the country. The Northwest experiences the next trough coming through. And as that heat builds in, it's gonna hit at a critical time for crop success here in the midsection of the country. So we've now got a better picture of this, better handle on it. And we need to watch model trends all week. I'll put the latest in tomorrow morning's report. For those of you that just watched the, the, the Monday, Thursday videos, we'll keep you updated next Thursday on how this is, or on this upcoming Thursday, on how this pattern's really gonna uh, unfold here over the coming days and weeks. But I still think uh, this La Nina, this La Nina right here, uh, is outdoing now what the North Pacific gave us at the beginning, uh, first three weeks of the month of July. So let's watch it, and we'll talk again on Thursday with these long-range updates. Thanks.